Welcome to Notes from Home, a podcast where we dive into the stories about the music and musicians that make Alabama home. I'm Katherine Bashir, And I'm Ernie Williams. And today we are thrilled to be here at the historic Carver Theater in downtown Birmingham, which is also home to the Alabama Jazz Hall of Fame. The theater has been newly renovated and is looking fantastic. Yeah, that's right. It does. It really looks amazing. And today we are joined by our special guest, Mr. Gil Anthony, who is a recognized authority on Southern Blues, and he hosts two weekly radio shows on WDIG Radio, um, and you have listeners from around the world. That we do. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gil, um, when and why did the blues click for you? Well, it actually has, has always been part of my life as long as I can remember. Growing up in North Dakota, I was probably the only kid that collected Ray Charles music back in the 1960s. And then when I, I moved from there to California to be in the military, I was in the Air Force and just being exposed to it in Southern California and all that. I've always been a soul person. I, I've loved soul music more than the pop music, but, uh, and it just got deeper and deeper. And I can remember, uh, it actually started when I lived in Santa Barbara. I remember going to a flea market and I love people I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. So I, I found these, uh, we were going through the flea market one day and I saw these 45s, they were, had an orange and blue label. And the three names I'll always remember, Lonesome Sundown, Lightning Slim, and Slim Harpo. I go, gosh, with this color label and those kind of names, yeah. it's got to be good. Yeah. You know, and that's really actually what started. And I ended up having, up until the, the mid-80s, I collected the Excello label, and I probably had one of the best collections. I think they did like 345s, about 312, and I had over 250 of them, and they were hard to get. But, uh, you know, it was just a experience then you start delving into other things you know mm -hmm. so that's what got me going really awesome well um in your perspective what makes the blues different or better than rock and roll or country or any other type of music well the blues is the origin blues and gospel are two that sort of coincide with one another they've sort of nurtured each other and to me if you look at some of the rock some of the pop some of the country their influences were blues music and yeah. it's just more soulful it more tells a story it's not just a cute little song where the lines rhyme and all that and if you look at some of the artists that are around that have been around for a while once they get to that certain point what do they do they record a blues album because they can they're they don't feel like they have to do what the record company tells them to i know peter frampton here has recorded a blues album a couple of years ago the stones started out as a blues band mm -hmm. fleetwood mac started out as a blues band they were very rich into blues and a lot of these groups have you know they get to a point of financial success to heck with it i'm going to do what i want what i yeah. really love and it turns out to be blues mm -hmm. so let's stay with that for just a second some people may have assumed that the blues may have been inherent to one particular ethnic group but as you're telling it from your original flea market finds to groups like Fleetwood Mac starting mm -hmm. as blues groups. That's not the case. Can you talk about that? And by the way, I'm people. But when people assume I'm people in this case, mm -hmm. I would have never thought that it didn't belong to one particular set of, of folks. Can you, can you explain that well, a little bit? Well, what it was, I think, you know, like I say, the, the church and blues are both very closely knit. Because if you listen to uh, gospel, if you listen to black gospel, they're talking about the same thing that a lot of the people that were working the fields and all that, yeah. the everyday yeah. thing. Well, for some reason, we were we neglected the white audience, neglected to uh, recognize the force of blues music until they recorded it over in Europe. And all of a sudden we go, man, that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. But one of my favorite lines, and this is no disparaging mark to English artists or whatever, Sonny Boy Williamson has a great, great quote. He said, Boy, those English boys, they sure wanted to play the blues real bad. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we discovered it through, like Fleetwood Mac, Eric mm -hmm. Burden, and the animals they played. They started out blues. I mean, even the Beatles and all the English groups. Mm -hmm. And then we recognized it. And it's, it's sad, but it finally came over here. And, you know, we just sort of embraced it. That's great. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so you started working in radio around 1969. 69, out of the Air Force. Yeah. Okay, and you've worked uh, at upwards of 30 different radio stations. Yeah, I've done, yeah, and also in my previous life, I did a lot of play-by-play, -play, huh. and I did a lot of high school play-by-play -play yeah. in <laughs> California and that. Yeah, I said, I've never had a job. I've never worked a day in my life. I haven't, <laughs> because I'm doing what I love. Yeah. So many yeah. people go through life, and all they think about is, when their next, when their retirement is, or when their next vacation mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. I've never dreaded going to work. You know, in mm -hmm. fact, now I, I've done my blues. I've been retired for about 10, 12 years, but I still do the blues because I love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what's the short version of your journey that got you to the Wiregrass? Short version is, uh, my wife, when she graduated college, worked for Bank of America, and we met this couple that was in the air. They were in the Air Force. It was an Air Force town. And they invited us to come visit in Mobile. They said, it was, south to us was South LA. <laughs> you know, south Los Angeles is as far south as we've been. So we came out and we liked it. And I decided, hey, we decided we could afford to live here more than in California. Mm -hmm. And I put a uh, ad in a trade magazine, in a radio trade magazine. A gentleman had bought just bought a radio station in Dalton, and he brought me out here to program it. And he hired everybody. We hired somebody from Chicago, from Kentucky and me from California, and that's how I got here, and I stayed here. I that's loved great. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and now, I know you are retired, but you do host your radio right. show a couple days a week, and mm -hmm. um, it's called Blues Power. Blues Power. Um, so can you, how can people listen, and can they you tell can, us Well, more? first of all, they can listen to WDIGradio.com on the TuneIn app. Mm -hmm. And they can listen to it at six to ten on Monday on Sunday nights, six to eleven on Monday nights. And I also do a Facebook live portion of it, which started I don't know how many years ago. But what happened was our server went out of business. I got to work one day and they said, We don't you can't stream your music. Uh, oh. the server went out of business in Ohio over the weekend. So I said, Okay. Well a friend of mine said, just take your phone, go to Facebook Live and put it near the monitor. So I did, and that caught on. Now I can't quit doing it <laughs> because I have people. I'm on for two hours. I'm sort of simulcasting. Mm -hmm. I'm acting a fool on Facebook Live and then doing a straight show. But <laughs> I have people that will message me. I'm sorry, I'm going to be late tonight. You know. Oh, wow. And so I mean, you and loyalists. Yeah, and they they are very dedicated fans from all over the mm -hmm. world. I have a lot of listeners down in Australia, Japan. Germany, England, Canada. I have a lot of listeners in Canada, and it's just my way of just, I, well, I want to keep exposing the blues to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So on that note, you're also one of the founders of the Wiregrass Blues Festival. Right. Uh, tell us about the, that event's beginnings yeah. and what it means to Wiregrass. It started actually about 10 years ago. Uh, a lady who's my partner in crime now, Jenny Brooks, a professor at Troy University, had moved down here from New York. And a mutual friend of ours said, hey, you need to meet this lady. She's very interested in blues and that. We started talking. And we wanted to enrich and let people become aware of the musical heritage of the Wiregrass area. Mm -hmm. So that's what we said. Okay, what can we do? We can start honoring people. Our first honoree was uh, Eddie Kirkland. Eddie was known as Gypsy of the Blues. He was born in Dalton, raised in Dalton. He backed up and he played with John Lee Hooker for several years back in the late 40s, early 50s. In fact, I heard, I can't remember, I was trying to remember last night if I heard it or I read it, but someone who was a real blues music historian said, if it wasn't for Eddie Kirkland, there would have been no John Lee Hooker. And that's a pretty oh, profound wow. statement, <laughs> you know, but I, yeah. it stuck with me. Yeah. And, you know, Eddie was the uh, gypsy of the blues, fog hat, idolized him, a lot of the rock groups idolized uh, Eddie. Eddie was a character in his own right. And he was our very first uh, honoree in 2010. And right about a month before we were supposed to honor him, he was coming back from a gig in uh, Tampa and pulled out in front of a Greyhound bus and died. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, we honored him. And we had, after we got done honoring him at presentation, we were in a room probably this size. And some of his relatives came up and they go, damn. I didn't realize that Eddie was that popular. He kept telling us all these stories, <laughs> but we thought they were stories. Yeah. We did not realize who he was. And yeah. we talked about that uh, just before. You're least famous in your home area. Right. Yeah. You right. know, everybody else knows about you. He was humongous over in Europe and he, everywhere else, mm -hmm. in Detroit, everywhere else. But uh, 
in his hometown, they didn't think, uh, they mm -hmm. thought he was just blowing smoke. I know, well, and we were talking a little earlier today about um, how you were saying that you like to make sure that people get recognized on this side of yes. the grass. Yes, yes. That's, that's my pet peeve, being in radio for so many years. As soon, one, as, soon as someone passed away, we do a radio. Oh, let's yeah. throw a special for Johnny Cash. You passed away. Yeah. What made it, you know, and that's one of my pet peeves also with our, our Blues Foundation. We give, uh, we have the uh, Blues Music Awards every year. Well, if this fan, like Alan Toussaint, who is a great piano player out mm -hmm. in New Orleans and wrote so many songs, the year after he died, he was given a Blues Music Award. <laughs> what happened? He wasn't that good when he was alive, and that's yeah. really my pet peeve. Yeah. It really is. Give them, and that's what I did with Paul Hornsby. We did it with several people. Uh, mm -hmm. Let them enjoy everything on this side of the grass, you know, mm -hmm. and like I say, Paul was, uh, Paul was one who said, God, you made me famous all over yeah, again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of these people were behind the scenes and they weren't recognized a lot except by people in the industry, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, even in Paul's hometown, I held a Paul Hornsby Day. Paul was the uh, producer at Capricorn. Well, we had like 230 some people at a banquet and a lot of people said, we wondered what happened to little Paul when he <laughs> left home, That's you funny. know. <laughs> And, and you happened. have a book. He yeah. wrote a book. Well, I, he wrote a book. It's called uh, Fix It in the Mix, Paul Hornsby. Paul tells about you know his involvement in the music industry in Macon, Georgia, with Otis Redding and a lot of the people that uh, came out of Macon and all that. And also, you know, this is my favorite uh, lady to, you know, Michael mm -hmm. Sporky, a German author, wrote a book called Big Mama Thornton, The Life and Music. Mm -hmm. And she comes from Ayrton, and unfortunately... She didn't get her due. She passed away in 84. And again, like I told you earlier, the, you, you're at least recognized. She was just inducted in the Alabama Music Hall of Fame right. two years ago. Yeah. Right. And she has been worldwide famous drawing. You know, over in Europe, she draw hundreds. I mean, well, actually, I think about the biggest crowd she paid for was 80,000 people in Europe. Wow. You know, and she was buried in an indigent grave. That's so, crazy. all right, let's stay on Big Mama for a minute. How did yeah. her music influence the birth of rock and roll? Oh, mm -hmm. very simple. Big Mama was one of the trailblazers. In fact, Big Mama's music is still being recorded today. You know, Ball and Chain was, became a hit for uh, Janis Joplin. Yeah. And, but she was a trailblazer. She took her career into her own hands. I think prior to her, the female artists were put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. They always followed up, you know, they opened the shows and, you know, they weren't the top biller. Right. Well, right. Big Mama, uh, Johnny Otis, who actually discovered her with the hound dog thing that he had Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller wrote for, uh, she opened up in the Apollo, Johnny Otis, I don't know if Johnny Otis discovered Etta James, and, uh, oh, wow. she, he discovered Etta James and Little Lester in the same week. <laughs> In the same week. Not and then a bad Big, week. Yeah, in the same week. And Big Mama Thornton, he had her out for a recording session, and she was recording some songs. And uh, Mike, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, who wrote so many hits for the Coasters and Elvis and just everything, uh, Johnny said, you need to write a song for this lady. So they went back to their hotel room that night and wrote Hound Dog, and mm. she recorded the next day and did it in one take, and that was it. Mm. And, you know, and Johnny Otis took her to the Apollo in New York, where Little Esther was the headliner. Well, Big Mama opened, they wouldn't let her come off the stage. The audience <laughs> loved her so much. Little Esther never did perform. Johnny said that oh. is the last time that she was ever the opening act. And she just took her, yeah. her you know, I, mm -hmm. I have several musicians who backed her up. I know several guys that backed her up. I know one time that Rod Piazza told me they pulled into a gas station and they were backing up a Big Mama and gas station attending, you know, back in the day when they used to put gas in yep. it, mm -hmm. you know, do that type of thing. He says, aren't you Big Mama Thornton? He says, well, my name is Willie Mae Thornton. My friends call me Big Mama. You can call me Willie Mae. <laughs> 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 That's the kind of person she was, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, and she, you know, you paid yeah. to have her play, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, she made sure. She was, she was just a trailblazer for women. And she is impressed. And there are contemporary blues artists now that still record Ball and Chain, that still record her songs, you know. And, I mean, she, is not, she has not been forgotten. And I know yeah. Sean Murphy, we talked about before we went on, Sean Murphy, a friend of mine who sang with Seeger and Clapton and Meatloaf and all that. Mm -hmm. She was fortunate to be at the 1969 Ann Arbor Blues Fest 
and she was just, she had an all-girl rock band or something, but Big Mama was there, Holland Wolf, Muddy Waters, and she saw, when she saw Big Mama, that was a turning point in her life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And now she's doing blues. She yeah. did her rock thing, right? Mm -hmm. Toured with everybody. Now she's doing blues. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. But uh, yeah, Big Mama. It's unfortunate. Like I told you, she died in Southern California, buried in an indigent grave, mm -hmm. yeah, with two other people. Uh, Erica Brown, who's a singer friend of mine from Denver, is working at that end to try and get her remains either put by herself in the cemetery she's at or move her to her hometown of Ayrton, Alabama. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, in October, we're having finally, one of the things that I was looking upon and we finally did it, we're having a street named after Big Mama. So That's exciting. Right. Yeah. I know, well, um, you seem to be on a mission to make sure that yes. she gets her due. Um, so aside from her Alabama birthplace, you know, what is it about her that just resonates so deeply with you? I don't know, it's just that she didn't get any do. You know, mm -hmm. we talked about it all the time. I remember Ruth Brown, who was a great artist, was a very close friend of mine. We used to talk about it all the time. She said, you know, I talked to Big Joe Turner, who was one of the shouters of rock and roll. He said, she said, and they would sort of sympathize with each other that it's so sad that they had to work so late in life and they're still working like a checkout clerk at a, a store, you know, I mean, they're having mm -hmm. to make ends meet all the time. And here they laid the foundation yeah. for what people are earning millions. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I get, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get emotional about that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 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 You know, and she did it. She yeah. worked for peanuts. Yeah. You know? yeah. Worked for peanuts. If she got paid at all. Yes. You know, Bobby Rush, uh, Bobby Rush told me. Uh, it was, he's 88 years old, and he said he remembers working for sandwiches. Mm. And he would he would get three sandwiches. He'd sell two and eat one, <laughs> so he had money. He'd split yeah. it with the band. Yeah. Then the next night they would get if they got five sandwiches, he sold five of them, mm. and and that's how he made money. You know, I mean that's ridiculous. It is. Yeah. It really is. All right, so I don't want to leave Big Mama, but aside, oh, that's all right. aside from her, who are some of your other blues influences? I don't know. I, I like them all. I do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have been blessed. Uh, Ruth Brown, who, you know, Atlantic Records was a house that Ruth built. She literally sold, you know, millions and millions of records. She was a close friend of mine. We talked a lot right up until her death. You know, I mean, if she said you... She'd always say, you and Bonnie Ray and BB are the only people that ever call me or keep in touch with me, you know, type thing. And, and I have found that, and I've been blessed to meet a lot of the people who are no longer with us. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just to give them some recognition. You know, I, you know, there are friends that I've had, like Ruth. I'd call her up on her birthday. We, we talked a lot, but a, a lot of the other artists that even come from Alabama, Jerry McCain, who came from Gadsden, you know, call them up on their birthday, let them know that they're not forgotten, right. and mm -hmm. just let them know that they were, they were an influence on what was happening. And you know, Ruth has been a, a great influence, and she still is. You know, in, in fact, Ruth and I were so close that yeah, I couldn't play her music for about a year. Yeah, you know, it just yeah. would knock me out after a year. I could listen to it, right? <laughs> right, right. You know, and yeah. I, I've I've just been blessed with a lot of the people that I've met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, I, the only thing that upsets me is I didn't start doing it sooner because I could have met Big Mama. Mm -hmm. I, she mm -hmm. died in '84. I was in California until 1979. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I could have seen Muddy. Mm -hmm. a, a very close friend of mine who passed away a year ago was the first white guy to play in Muddy's band. He lived in Muddy's basement. <laughs> he lived in the basement. He lived in the back apartment. Otis Spann, the great piano player, lived in the front apartment. And Paul has so many stories. He was just a great storyteller. And that was another thing. He, uh, he called, no, he messaged me a year ago. Oh, a little more than a year ago. It was on his birthday. I wished him a happy birthday. He said, Gil, call me. He had gotten a new phone. You'd have to know Paul. But he, he got a new phone. He didn't have my number. So I called him. And he said he was in the hospital at that time. He was feeling better and all this. He was planning to come out here, play at the uh, uh, the club in the every Capital Oyster Bar, Montgomery. Mm -hmm. He was going to stay at my house. He was going to play at the King Biscuit Festival in Helena and play in Tallahassee and that. And about, I can't remember, about two weeks later, 
friend of mine messaged me, Paul died last oh, night. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, stuff like that really hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do it now. Contact yeah, people yeah, now. Yeah. Stay yeah. in touch. You know, that's what I say. Yeah. Let them know how yeah. much you appreciate them. No, mm -hmm. matter, no, matter what, no matter what field you're in, let mm -hmm. those people know that mm -hmm. you appreciate what they've done mm -hmm. if they've been part of your life. Yeah. yeah. That's wise. Right. Um, and you are such a great support, it seems, you know, to all these artists that you know and love. And so can you tell us, is there an Alabama blues talent that's sort of up and coming that, you know, people may not know about that they should know about? Well, no, there aren't that many young people, but there are. I have a young man. We do the Blues in Schools program, the mm -hmm. Wiregrass Blues Society. Yep. Mm -hmm. we, in fact, this year alone, we've done over 3,000 kids. Wow. that we did with Blues in Schools. And mm -hmm. I have brought this young man, he's not from Alabama, he's from across the line, Quincy, Florida, which is outside of Mariana, Florida. He's 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And he can't read a lick of music, he's never had a lesson in his life, <laughs> but you ought to hear him play the guitar. Wow. He practices sometimes five hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I've taken him to two or three Blues in Schools because the young people can relate to him a lot more. They can That's see right. what he can do. Right. You know, they're tired of seeing gray old haired men <laughs> talking about blues, you know, I mean, really. And when they see someone their age, they realize no matter if it's blues or whatever, he, they see what he can do with that instrument. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an incentive. If we reach one kid, I'm happy. Yeah. We've done blues in schools. We had uh, Crystal Shawanda, who's a great singer out of Nashville. She's an indigenous, 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 there you go. Native American from Canada, <laughs> yep. just a great artist. And we took her to my, Big Mama's hometown at Ayrton. We did a blues in schools, and she can relate because a lot of the stuff that uh, Big Mama went through, a lot of her people went through in mm -hmm. Canada and this type of thing. But we had kids come up to talk to her afterwards. And if, if it, and she's the same way. If it hit and affects one kid, you've accomplished your mission. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel about it. We, yeah. We, if we change one person's life, you know, I had a girl come up and say, well, my dad said, I can't sing a lick, you know, this and that type of thing. And, and she sang, she sounded beautiful, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Crystal was so encouraging to her. And that's mm -hmm. all they need is something, a little encouragement. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So about a decade ago, um, the Blues Foundation, which is in Memphis, gave you an award called oh, yeah. the Keeping the Blues Alive Award, which is quite appropriate. Yeah, it yes. was. Uh, tell us <laughs> what that means, well, what that meant to you. I tell you, for one thing, keep, uh, Keeping the Blues Live Award is not a popularity contest. They, nobody votes on it or anything. Somebody who is a previous winner of a Keeping the Blues Live Award has to nominate you. And a, your whole body of work goes in front of a panel, and they look to see what you've done in the way of blues. So it was a very humbling experience. Mm -hmm. The best part, not the best part, but one of the things my wife told me, she said, you know why they gave it to you now, you know, being what? alive? Yeah, I said, why? She said, because nobody in the media can either spell or pronounce posthumous. <laughs> <laughs> she said, kidding, and that was my closing line uh -huh. for receiving the award. But it was very, it was very humbling. It still is when I think about it. Did you get to know who nominated you? Yeah, I knew who nominated okay. me, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they told me afterwards yeah. who, who nominated me, you know, but... But yeah, and you know, so the, like to say, it's not a po that's what's even yeah. more humbling. It's not a popularity contest who gets the most votes. It's they look at what you've done, you know. Mm -hmm. So well, congratulations. Yeah, that was that. It, I still look at it. It's about it's a weapon. It weighs about 12, 15 pounds, <laughs> you know. And you know, it's when when other guys get it, you know, I always say welcome to the little fraternity because yeah. it's a select group. You know, it really is yeah. cool. Yeah. Well. Um, you know, you've dedicated so much of your life now to preserving and spreading you know, knowledge and a love of blues music. So, you know, you're really kind of a historian of, of the blues music. Um, so what, ha what would you say that the performers have, have taught you the most? Performer, performers in blues are totally, a totally different breed. We're family. Mm-hmm. We really are. We talk about it all the time. I, I, I talk about it with musicians there. When, when we go to Memphis, we see each other maybe twice a year, you know, mm -hmm. other than not being on the road and seeing somebody. But we're family. You know, we catch up on things. We've, we've all heard the music. We say that. We've all heard the music. The music is great. But what's great is this. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. You know, like I was going up the elevator once at the Sheraton in uh, Memphis, and this guy asked me, he said, what's going on down there? What do you mean? He said, I've never seen so much hugging and laughing <laughs> in all my, he said, who are these people, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, it's our family, you know, mm -hmm. and it really is. And, and these guys, they're the Blues family. They do it for a living. Mm -hmm. they're, they don't play like the Rolling Stones once a you know, they go out on tour once a year and play a few dates and that. They have to work three, four nights a week just to make it meet, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when they're home, they're doing their laundry. They're getting another other bookings, lining up things. So yeah. it's just like you and I going to work nine mm -hmm. to five, but theirs happens to be nine in, in the evening to five in the morning mm -hmm. type right. of thing. Mm -hmm. So really, that's, you know, just to appreciate everything, you know, mm -hmm. to, to appreciate the family. We, we always look forward to just seeing each other, you know. It seems like the blues uh, enjoys more popularity in other parts of the world versus here in this country where it was born, mm -hmm. where it's struggling for recognition yeah. to even grab a foothold. Your opinion, what is the status of blues in the U.S.? Well, right now, it's, it's gone through a rough time because, for, because of COVID and everything. A mm -hmm. lot of little clubs closed and this type of thing. And, and we take things for granted, just like you, you and I take everyday things and we we took a lot of things for granted until COVID hit us and we go holy right. smoke I can't do that or I can't do why can't I you know mm -hmm. and it's the same with the blues you can see somebody every night like I was talking to a friend of mine Joanna Connor who lives in Chicago and she said every night in Chicago she used to be able to go to a, a blues club and see some of the great Chicago musicians and artists and all this type of thing and now a lot of those little places have closed because mm -hmm. a lot of them like the friend of mine who has a club in Tallahassee, he's a retired lawyer. I think out of the 20 years he's had the club, he's probably been in the black once or mm -hmm. twice. He does it because he loves it, mm -hmm. and they yeah. do it. Most of them do it because they love it. They're not, if you're doing it to make a living, you know, you're not going to make it yeah. as a club. You know, <laughs> I mean, I really, I, I have a friend that has a club in, San, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Bob Corator. Mm -hmm. He has the rhythm room. And he said it wasn't for other genres of music. Yeah. They support his blues fix. He can right. bring in his yeah. old friends and and plus they pay they they play for you know minuscule right. in comparison yeah. to overpriced other genres. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so what's next for Gil Anthony? Whew. What's up? <laughs> Just keep going. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I you know, have all these little projects, you know, I'd love to do I want to get I uh, I'd I'd like to get a music hall of not a, mu a music museum started mm -hmm. in the Dothan area because we had such great musical talent come out of there and I've talked to a couple people who said if our generation doesn't do it it's going to be lost because mm -hmm. we have people that came out of the Wiregrass area uh, Buddy Bowie who wrote Spooky Stormy Traces Every Day with You Girl all the Atlanta rhythm section music that was his group he's from Dothan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the uh, Roy, Roy Orbison, the Candyman, the, the guys that backed him, they were from Dothan. Uh, mm -hmm. Just everybody, there were, you know, we, and the blues artists like Big Mama, uh, Eddie Kirkland, Paul Hornsby. Uh, there were so many background musicians. Mike McCarty, who did over 400 album covers, the artwork and that. Mm -hmm. You know, those people are leaving a legacy, and sometimes they don't even realize it. Like, I remember working with Buddy maybe 20 years ago, and I... I asked Gloria, his wife, I said, did Buddy realize he's leaving a legacy? Because how many times have you heard Spooky recorded or Stormy or Traces? Yeah. He said he's just beginning to realize it. Mm -hmm. And same with Mike, who did over 400 album covers. Everyone from Isaac Hayes to Atlanta Rhythm Section to William Bell, whoever. Uh, he just realized in the last couple of years. And how many times, did you, if you bought albums, how many times did you pick up an album because of the cover? Most of the time. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's what Mike was responsible for. That's very and cool. Mike did over 400 album covers, the artwork, and, you know, mm -hmm. and to get those people recognized. You know, I, I'm still pushing to get Mike into the Alabama Music Hall of Fame because he's leaving a legacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, there are, and not saying they're not deserving, but they have people that are one-hit wonders sure. in the Hall right. of Fame. Sure. But here's a guy whose career has spanned five decades, mm -hmm. in excess of five decades. He mm -hmm. should not be in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So that, that's really my, my thing is to just, you know, get people to appreciate what we've got. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Yeah. Well, Gil, as we close, I have to say uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Close? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> all good things, right? Um, you you have educated us and shared with us, and it's been fantastic. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I yeah. do. If I reach one person, I've done my job. Awesome. Definitely. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us on Notes from Home. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe. And if you'd like to see more uh, from our interview here with Gil, please visit us at alabamanewscenter.com.